Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. This is college algebra. Uh, <clears throat> I'm your instructor, Dr. Brady McCary. We're going to go over the syllabus uh, briefly. Uh, so this is me in the middle here, Brady McCary. The best way to contact me is email. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of email, we all have UTD email addresses. I have one, you have one. and uh, the university prohibits uh, us from conducting any university business that's not over UTD email. So I can perfectly appreciate that you have a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or whatever. If you send me an email from one of those accounts, I'm just going to ignore it or delete it if it's not automatically deleted okay, by my filters. So you've got to use your UTD account. Uh, Besides this section, which is section 005, you're also enrolled in the exam section, which is 701. 701 meets on Mondays, but it doesn't meet today because there's not an exam today. Okay, there's a midterm ex exam and a final exam, and those aren't, neither of those are today. So the exam section is not meeting today. The textbook for this course, the physical textbook, looks like this. It's published by OpenStax. Um, you can download a PDF of this book off the internet for free, not like uh, illegitimately, but legitimately. It's, you can just go uh, to this link right here and get a, get a copy of it. Uh, we'll be using an online homework service called WebAssign. Uh, so you don't have to purchase a textbook, but you are going to have to purchase a WebAssign license. There's two ways to get a WebAssign license. One way is to go to the bookstore, and they've got a stack of WebAssign licenses. Okay. Now, if you do that, you have to buy the one that corresponds to this publisher. That's because there's a lot of publishers for textbooks, and only one of them is named OpenStax. Okay. So we're using an OpenStax textbook, so the WebAssign license that you purchase must say OpenStax on it and not some other publisher. Now, uh, the other way to get a WebAssign license is when you log into WebAssign, and I'll send the instructions on, on how to log into WebAssign tonight. When you log into WebAssign, it'll say uh, you still have 14 days of grace period where you don't have to have a license to continue. Do you want to buy your license right now? If so, click here. Then you can, you can do it that way, and you, you couldn't possibly make an error of selecting the wrong publisher in that case. Okay. So any question about that? Okay, so you'll need regular access to a computer uh, to, so we can do email stuff and so you can do homework stuff. And besides uh, WebAssign web browser homework, you'll also uh, do some written homework where you download some PDFs off the internet, print them, fill them out, bring them here. Okay, so you'll need regular access to a printer also. So there are some prohibited supplies. Okay, so as for the classroom, the lecture room, uh, I don't want you actively using anything that has a screen on it. So that means a cell phone. Uh, that means a, a laptop. Okay, I don't want I don't want any of that. So there's a couple reasons. In the first place, you know, if you have a screen open, maybe you should consider paying attention to class. Otherwise, why are you here? Uh, but besides you yourself, the, the bigger problem really is that if you have a screen open and you're looking at something that's interesting like cat videos on YouTube, then you and everyone behind you is now more interested in cat videos on YouTube than algebra. This just can't compete okay, with that kind of thing. So, so uh, screens and, and anything that's going to distract your neighbors is just not allowed during lecture. 
Uh, as for the quizzes, you're not allowed any kind of device that that can communicate at all, like a cell phone or, or, or anything like that. No communications devices whatsoever. You're allowed a calculator, but your calculator cannot be uh, something that can plot, cannot be something that can solve an equation or do any kind of symbolic manipulation at all. Such calculators are prohibited. This is the kind of calculator that I recommend. So you can look that up on the internet and you'll get a million hits. Okay. Uh, at the present time, these cost between ten and fifteen dollars. <coughs> Any questions about that? So to be clear, I don't care what kind of calculator or, or resource you use on homeworks because I can't police that kind of thing. Do whatever you want. But when it comes to a quiz where your ID is going to be checked and you're going to be watched and everything like that, you can't use a fancy calculator. <coughs> Uh, we'll be using Blackboard. Uh, UTD's installation of Blackboard is called e-learning. You have one section for each course, uh, one e-learning section for each course you're enrolled in at UTD. Uh, there's a place called the Testing Center. That's where you'll take quizzes. It's in the basement of the library. Quizzes start next week. I'll send you messages about how to get there and, and all of that. Uh, this is the course web page where you can download this uh, uh, this syllabus if you wanted to. And any changes that are made to the syllabus will, will be updated there. Uh, this course web page is also important because uh, that's also where you download the copies of your paper homework. So it'll be important for that. And when your paper homeworks and quizzes are graded, this is where you will get copies of your graded uh, graded homeworks so you can download your copies there because I won't be returning physical copies. Uh, another thing that's posted at the course webpage is as the lecture proceeds I'll be writing the lecture out on pieces of paper and I'll scan those pieces of paper and post them here so the lecture notes will be posted. In addition to that there's a camera rolling and I am recording all of this and in a couple hours time it'll already be on YouTube so you can look at it uh, look at it on YouTube so I'm letting you know that uh, because I don't want you to be anxious if you if you miss something inadvertently however don't take it as license not to show up because I'll be taking attendance okay good there's a place on campus that is also in the library called the math lab you can think of it like a little bit like a tutoring service that's not exactly what it is, but you can think of it like that. It's at no additional charge, and I say no additional charge to you because you're already uh, paying for it, right? Your tuition and fees fund the math lab. I highly recommend that you spend some time there. Any question about any of that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the makeup policy is pretty simple. There, is no, there are no makeups without a university approved excuse. Okay, so I, I get it. Uh, there's lots of reasons to have, uh, to, to miss something, that's fine. There's slack built into the system so that everyone can miss their somethings and not be, not be penalized. A little bit of slack, right? You can't just never come or something like that. So here's a link with uh, UTD's official syllabus policies. It includes a lot, and this is part of not just this syllabus, but the syllabus of every class that you're in. Uh, it includes things like what constitutes academic dishonesty, which is a euphemism for cheating. Okay, so pl please don't do that. Uh, there's also things in there like, did you know that people can carry firearms on campus? That's a, that's a relatively recent thing. So you should look at the contents of, of this link so that you're familiar with them. One important thing about the contents of this link is that um, there is on campus an office called the Office of Student Accessibility. So if you've, if you've heard of that, then I'm talking to you. If you don't know what the Office of Student Accessibility is, then I'm probably not talking to you. So the OSA uh, is, the, is the place on campus which directs instructors to say something like, this student needs to take their quizzes in a low sound environment or a high sound environment 
or a low light or whatever. They're the ones that make, uh, that allow testing and lecture conditions to be modified. Okay, so otherwise I'm constrained to treat all students the same, and that's what I will do, is I'll treat all of you exactly the same. So if you have an OSA uh, case, I must remind you that OSA does not inform me, only you can inform me. If you don't inform me, then I simply won't be informed. Also, your testing conditions and lecture conditions and everything else will not be changed. So if you have an OSA, uh, un unless you inform me, to be clear. Uh, so if you have an OSA uh, case, please bring it to my attention uh, as soon as possible, even immediately after lecture. <clears throat> okay, some additional notes um, that we need to go over. So this course more than any other math course is about showing your work. Okay, Your work is what's being graded. If you don't supply any work, you should have no expectation of receiving any credit. So that sword cuts both ways, which is to say that suppose you supply some work that's correct, but at the end of the exercise you say, and therefore 38 plus 4 is 70. Okay, But everything up to there was good. Well, you're going to get a lot of partial credit. Okay, good. So uh, another matter is that I'll be posting announcements as new homeworks become available and things like that. And they get posted to Blackboard with, and that also gets posted to your UTD email. So if you do not check your UTD email for a week and then you realize, oh, I missed a whole bunch of assignments just now. I'm sorry, that's your fault. <laughs> You didn't check your email for a week? My goodness. <clears throat> so this is the schedule uh, of content that we'll go over from, from this textbook and this one. So these sections, that textbook, there's a few comments here. Uh, there's no class on Monday the 4th, because that's Labor Day. Uh, that's in the third week and in the ninth week that's when we have our midterm exam so that's nice uh, and then this is when we have the final exam and that's the Thanksgiving week we're we're entirely uh, no no classes the university there's no classes on how do they say it Monday Tuesday and Wednesday and then the university is closed on Thursday and Friday so in effect nothing's happening Good. Any questions about the schedule? Okay, this link to the academic calendar that says things like um, what days the university is closed, when are grades due, when is money due, when's the last day to withdraw, all that kind of stuff. So you should be familiar with that also. So this is the, the part that's probably most important to all of us. This is how your grade will be computed uh, in the semester. So there are three kinds of assignments in the class. There's online homeworks. That's the stuff that you do on WebAssign. There will be one online homework per lecture. And because there's approximately 44 lectures, that means that there's going to be approximately 44 online homeworks. So today, after lecture, I'm going to go back to my office, make an online homework, and post a message that says on that online homework one is posted. It will be due Sunday at 11.59 p.m. That is one minute before next Monday. That's when it's due. Okay, and then on Wednesday I'll post another online homework and I'll post a message that say that it's that it's posted and it will be due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. That is to say one minute before the, the next Wednesday. Okay, same with Friday, same with all the days. Okay, so then uh, there'll be, because there's going to be about 40 online homeworks and we drop the lowest 10 percent, that means that the lowest four online homeworks are going to be dropped from your online homework average. Online homeworks constitute 10 percent of your grade. Written homeworks, these are, these are uh, exercises on pieces of paper that you must download a PDF, print them, fill them out, bring them to class. There'll be a little, little boxes that say this is for this online homework, or this is for this written homework, the other box is for the next written homework, the other box is for the other one. So you bring them to class, you put them in the boxes. So for each lecture, there's going to be about three exercises. 
written homework exercises. Okay, and you'll have to bring them in. Uh, not all of these exercises are going to be graded. Some of them are just going to be completion. Altogether, there's going to be approximately 120 uh, written homeworks. So about 30 of them will be graded uh, by hand, 90 of them completion. I won't inform you in, in advance which is which because that's the only way I can make sure you do all of them. And um, we'll drop the lowest three graded ones and the lowest nine completion ones. Okay, and that's how your written homework grade will be computed. That's 10% of your grade. The majority of your grade is from quizzes. So quizzes will be done in the testing center. That's a, that's a big, big room in the basement of the library. You show up, you say, I'm so-and-so here to take uh, a quiz for college algebra. And they say, OK, let me see your ID and all of that. And then you show up and take the quiz. Uh, quizzes are going to be 70% of your grade. So 70% of your course grade is coming from the quizzes. The reason why it's so high is because that's the only thing that I'm making sure that you're actually doing it, right? As far as I know, you download your written homework and hand it over to someone else, and they do it and turn it in. Okay? I, that's not a good strategy. I don't recommend it <laughs> for a lot of reasons. For one reason, you won't learn anything. For another reason, I'm pretty good at checking handwriting, and if I so happen to see that it's not the same, then that will be a problem. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So one test, one, one quiz per week at the testing center, starting next week. Uh, fine. The, the exam section is self-explanatory. And attendance and participation will also be uh, measured. So we're not taking attendance today because the, the, the roster is always in a state of flux on the first day. Uh, and and so on, but probably starting next week we're going to start taking attendance. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, at the math lab, the math lab will have an attendance sheet, and I'll know for each week whether or not you went to the math lab that week. Furthermore, I keep track of all the assignments that you've turned in. Okay, so then taking all of that together, your, your attendance and participation in all the activities of this course, coming to lecture, turning things in, uh, going to the math lab, and all of that, I'll use all of that data to, to calculate your attendance and participation, and that's worth 10%. It's an extremely easy 10% to get, as long as you're present and accounted for. Any questions about the, uh, anything on the syllabus? Any questions about it? OK, so to kind of help you understand the way the assignments go, So we have a week, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, Saturday. Okay, so obviously we, we only do lectures on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So this is, here we are, first lecture. From this lecture, there's going to be several written homeworks. They are due here. Okay, from this one, from the Wednesday lecture, several more written homeworks. They're due here. From this one, several more written homeworks, they're due here. Okay, that's the stuff that you download and print and bring to, bring to lecture. Besides that, there's also online homework. So the online homework is going to be due here. Today's online homework is going to be due one minute before this Monday. This one is due here. This one is due here.
Okay, then from all of these days, all of these lectures, you're going to have to take a quiz over those lectures during this week, this third week. That doesn't mean you take it every day. That means that's the window in which you must take it. So to be, to be clear, everything is spread out over three weeks. This week, we're lecturing over stuff. Next week is when you're turning in all the homeworks over that stuff. And the next next week is when you're doing quizzes over all that stuff. Okay, so as these homeworks are due, as they become due, I will post keys, both PDFs and videos, of how they're all solved. The quiz that occurs in this week will be over the homeworks that were turned in the previous week. The homeworks that are turned in in this week are always over the lectures that occurred in the previous week. So by the time we get to like the fifth week or something, it's all going to be happening at the same time. We'll be lecturing over new things, turning in homework over the previous week's things, and quizzing over the previous previous week's things. Okay? Any question about the way it's going to go? It'll all be nicely summarized in a calendar that it, I'll post a link to it uh, this afternoon. Any questions? Okay. So let's get to section 1.1. Section 1.1, it's called something like the reels. <clears throat> okay, so when I'm making a remark, I make a little box, half box thingy that says that I'm making a remark. So I'm making a remark about sets of numbers. So the first set of numbers that we need to deal with is called the naturals. It is denoted with this fancy looking N. So this is called blackboard bold uh, because when you write the, the, the symbol for the natural numbers in a textbook, you usually write it in bold, but I don't have a bold pencil. So I've got to do something to make it seem as if I'm making it bold, and that's how you do it. You make that little leg a box. The natural numbers, at least according to our textbook, are the positive integers. One, two, three, four, etc. So other, other textbooks consider zero to be a natural, but this textbook doesn't, so we don't. Zero is not natural. So can someone tell us a number that's a number, but not natural? Negative two. I agree with both of those. Negative one and negative two are both not natural. Can someone tell us a natural that I didn't happen to explicitly include? Six. How about 1,314? Ha ha, because that's the course we're in. OK, good. The integers is the next one. So if the naturals are denoted with an N, then what are the integers denoted with? <laughs> a Z, obviously. You would think I. So the integers are denoted with Z, so 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, etc. The reason for Z is because when this convention w was being set down, it was not set down in an English-speaking country. It was uh, set down in a country that is now Switzerland, where they were speaking German. And the German word for number is Zahlen. Starts with a Z. Okay. So I'd like for you to notice that every natural is an integer. But not every integer is natural. 
Okay. The next set is the rationals. Rationals. And what are, how are the rationals denoted? <laughs> no takers this time. With a Q for quotient. So this is now the set of all P divided by Q such that P and Q are in the integers and Q is not zero. So the state of Texas assures me that you're familiar with all of this set notation, but I'll just remind you that the vertical bar means such that The state of Texas has been known to make mistakes from time to time. So um, can someone give us an example of a rational number? Two thirds. That's a rational. OK. So now let's consider five. Five is an integer. Is five rational? It's definitely one of those answers. <laughs> the answer is yes. Because how can you express 5 as the ratio of two integers? 5 over 1, or 50 over 10, or a multitude of other ways. Right? So I'd like for you to observe that every uh, integer is rational. How about 0? Is 0 rational? How could you write 0 as the ratio of two integers? Zero. 0 over 1. 0 over 1 million. A lot of ways. OK. So um, every natural is an integer, but not vice versa. And every integer is rational, but not vice versa. Can someone tell us a rational that's not an integer? Three point four. I'm not even sure that that's a rational. Is it a rational? Uh, I was hoping so. Hoping so? 3.5. <laughs> OK. Is, is 3.5 a rational? I think so. It's 7 over 2. 7 over 2. OK. There you have it. So 7 over 2. 34 over 10, right? That would have worked, too. So uh, essentially, every number in human experience is rational in the sense that uh, for example, there's, if everyone is here, there's 48 people here. That's a rational number. And there's approximately 24,000 people uh, at UTD. So that means that of all the people enrolled at, at UTD, this, we, we represent 48 over 24,000 of them. That's a rational number. If you order a pizza and eat three slices out of, out of eight, you ate three-eighths of a pizza. So there's rational numbers like all over the place. Now I have a question for you. Are there any numbers that are not rational? You think so? Yeah. Can, can anyone give us an example of a number that's not rational? I'm not even going to go there. I don't even know what that means. Uh, pi. Pi. Pi is an example of a number that's not rational. Okay, that, is the, that is to say the circle constant, pi. It's not rational. So that, that's a pretty um, tall order to say that there's numbers that can't be expressed as the ratio of two integers. Because uh, besides a number like pi, you might be kind of hard pressed to think of a number that can't be represented as the ratio of two integers. And furthermore, how, how, how could you verify that pi is not the ratio of two integers? How could you do it? Not clear. So the set of all numbers is called the reals. It is denoted with fancy r. So this is all numbers. And I have to put it in scare quotes because I can't be, give you the precise mathematical definition. Uh, the reals. It's all of them. None of them are left out. Okay, so then <clears throat> this little symbol 
is pronounced therefore. So therefore we have the inclusion that the naturals are a subset of the integers which are a subset of the rationals which are a subset of the reals. So the reals are, are where we're working. So now I need to prove to you that the reals actually, that, that it actually is meaningful to talk about the reals rather than just the rationals. Uh, it's always important to establish that something exists before you start having any, any serious conversation about it. Because logic, otherwise you're subject to funny and sometimes terrible logical pitfalls. So for example, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a statement. UTD's football team is undefeated. Is that a true statement? Yes, that is a true statement. Why is it a true statement? Because you just consider the list of all games that our football team has ever participated in. Are there any losses? There aren't any. Therefore, we've won all of them. Okay, also, it is also true to say that we've lost all of them. It is also true to say that at the halftime of every one of them, there was a, a purple banana dancing at midfield. All of those statements are entirely valid because the set of, because there are no such objects. So, so I'm telling you that there's numbers that are real yet not rational. So now I need to establish for you that there is such a thing. Otherwise, what are we talking about? <clears throat> so I'm going to prove to you the existence of a number that's, that uh, is not rational. So this page, so on this page, I'm going to write a mathematical proof. You're not going to be tested over it. So there's, there's uh, two main reasons for me to, to do this. One reason is that as a mathematician, I have, I have to establish that there actually are numbers that are real and not just rational so that we can actually be, be sure that we're talking about something. The other reason is that some of you may actually be a math major and not know it. Right? So you might see this proof and say, you know what? I think I'm going to be a math major. That guy can dream. Okay? It's happened about four times in my, in my life that students have said, I, 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 now I see I'm going to be a math major. So here we go. So what we're going to do in particular is we're going to prove that the square root of 2 is not uh, rational. I'm going to show that it's not rational. So in the first place, the square root of 2 is a number. And the calculator can give us a pretty good approximation of it. So if you were to take that number by hand using the longhand method and write 1.414 blah, 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 times 1 point blah, 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 and, and add up all the stuff, you'd get a number that's really close to 2. It wouldn't be exactly 2, uh, but it would be really close to 2. So the way we're going to prove this is we're going to assume the square root of 2 is rational. Specifically, we're going to assume that the square root of 2 is equal to p divided by q, that p and q are in the integers. <coughs> and because the square root of 2 is evidently positive, that means that I can take p and q both to be positive. Because they're either both positive or both negative. So I'm going to just take the case that they're both positive. And I'm going to make one more requirement that uh, p over q is simplified. So what do I mean by that? What does that mean? Or alternatively, what does it mean to have a, to have a fraction that's not simplified? like 4 over 6. 4 over 6, both numerator and denominator have a common factor of 2. You could, you could factor that out and cancel. 4 over 6 is the same as 2 over 3, is the same as 400 over 600. 
etc. So what I mean is that p over q is simplified. Okay. Well, we could take this equation right here, square root of 2 is p over q. I'm going to multiply both sides by q. Now I'm going to square both sides. Uh, squared. So now how do we carry out the left-hand side? What happens to the square? How does it work? So it sort of, it goes, because this is a product, this, the exponent distributes over the product, and this one gets it, and this one gets it. Okay, so they both get it. So that it looks like square root 2 squared q squared is p squared. But then what's the square root of 2 squared? It's 2. So 2 q squared is p squared. Now, so what we're saying is that p squared is, is twice q squared. So, as a consequence of that, we can say, therefore, p squared is even. Because after all, it's, it's two times some other thing. So it's even. But now let's think about this for a moment. If p squared is even, that means that it has at least one factor of 2. But because it's being squared, that means it has two factors of 2. And you can see that in the following kind of way. Can someone give me an odd number that's more than 1? 13. 13. Okay, not divisible by 2. That's what it means to be odd. Now, square 13, what do you get? 169. Do you observe that it's also odd? If you take an odd number and you square it, the result is still odd. What about if you take an even number, like, say, 8? Square 8, what do you get? 64. Still even, right? So... So, if p squared is even, what does that mean about p? It means that p is even. So, if p, squ if p squared is even, then p is even. So, therefore, we could say that p is 2m for some m. Don't know what m, but just some m. It's equal to 2 times something. So now we're going to take this information, that p is 2m, and we're going to put it right there. So continuing that equation, 2 times q squared is 2m all squared. So when you, when you carry out the arithmetic operation on the right side, what do you have? 4m squared, right? So you get 2 times q squared is, I'll, I'll do it in little baby steps, 2 squared times m squared. So that 2q squared is 4m squared. And now how could we simplify this equation? We could divide by 2, right? What would be the new left-hand side if we did that? q squared, and what would be the new right-hand side? 2m squared. Okay. Therefore, what about q squared? I hope you're getting deja vu. What can we say about q squared? It has to be even. And therefore, what about q? q is even. Surely you jest. This can't possibly be true. Why can this not possibly be true? Yeah. Notice what we've said. We've said that as a result, 
of p over q being simplified, it's not simplified. <laughs> this is not logically possible. So this is a contradiction. Contradiction. And therefore the only, so specifically it is a contradiction of our assumption that it was simplified. Therefore, the only possible uh, resolution to this is that square root of 2 is not rational. That's interesting. Wow. So, square root of 2 is not rational, and here's a math proof. This is the kind of mental gymnastics that math majors have to go through. So, if you weren't drawn to this as I was doing it and thinking, wow, that's really neat, then one more confirmation that you don't want to be a math major, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Any questions about this? Okay. Next. So here's a nice uh, item. <clears throat> so I'd like for you to recall uh, that, say, what, what does this mean? 54.2873, and I put a bar over the 873. What does that mean? It means that bit is repeating, right? It means uh, that this is equal to 54.2, and then there's as many 873s, uh, there's infinitely many of them. So 873, 873, 873, dot, dot, dot. So that, that, that over bar means uh, those digits repeat forever. OK. So here's the question. Express, <coughs> express the number 0 0.1275 repeating uh, as a rational. So some of you probably know a neat trick where you can just say what the answer is immediately. So does anyone know neat trick? Good. Because if you just write down the answer, then you'll get a zero. And because the point is, is I want to see the process of how you arrive at that answer. OK. So uh, we'll say that x, we'll give a name to that number. x is 0 0.1275, all repeating. <coughs> My first question to you is how many repeating digits are there? How many? There's four, right? One, two, three, four. So I could give you a long one that had like 13 digits, and okay, then, then it, the answer would be 13 or whatever. So how many repeating digits? Uh, there's four. So as a result of that, we're going to multiply by 10 to 4. 10 to 4. If there had been 8 repeating digits, we would multiply by 10 to 8. 10 to 4 is, of course, 10,000. So notice what happens when we do this. So 10,000x is what? What will we get? So what, what if we had just multiplied by 10? What would that do in effect? It would, it would move the place one position to the right. If we multiplied by 100, what would it do? Two to the right. 
But we're, we're because because we're multiplying by 10,000, what's going to happen is the point is going to move all the way past one full cycle of repetitions. So what you're going to get is you're going to get 1, 2, 7, 5, and then point 1, 2, 7, 5, and all of these are repeating again. Right? So we just skipped past uh, one set. Now, what happens if we do 10,000 x's and we subtract just one x? Just take one of them away. <clears throat> well, that would be 1275.1275 repeating and then minus 0 0.1275 repeating. That much minus that much. So how many x's are there on the left hand side? Yep. There's 9,999 x's. And then what is the numerical value of the right hand side? Yep, just 1275 because the fractional part got, gets completely canceled, right? So now, can you solve for x? Yeah. So x is 1275 over 999. So after you've done a number of these, you can more or less, in your head, just jump straight to the end. And many students are um, tempted to take a question like this take a question like this and just write that, you'll receive a zero for such a response. Why will you receive a zero for such a response? You didn't show any work. Okay, it's the work that we're interested in, the process. Good. Any question about this kind of thing? Okay, another matter. is there's something called the order of operations. And I uh, will have to be the bearer of bad news that in seventh grade, Mrs. Harris lied to you <laughs> about the order of operations. Okay, so then I could ask you, what is the name of, how do you pronounce the acronym that is the order of operations? PEMDAS, right? Eh. Not right. Sorry, Ms. Harris. I wish you would stop saying that. So the true order of operations starts out like this. So, so far, so good. Right. Except multiply and divide are on the same level, and add and subtract are also on the same level. These are resolved left to right. So let me explain what I mean. So if we do 60 uh, divided by 4 multiplied by 3, then Mrs. Harris would have you believe that the answer is 5. And half of, half of people on Facebook would have also have you, we're almost done here, would also have you believe that the answer is 5. Okay? But it's not. Let's consider. What kind of operation is this? This is a division. What kind of operation is this? That's a multiply. Now, if your order of operations is PEMDAS, that means that you need to do this one first. But that's not true. What's that sound? OK. The true order of operations says what comes first. No. This one. Because these are occurring simultaneously, which one is further to the left? This one. This one is first. So even though you remember PEMDAS from grade school, this division occurs before this 
multiplication because they're all together and this one's furthest to the left. And 60 divide by, oops, multiply by 4 divide by 3. Again, this one is a multiply. This one is a divide. And which one comes first? This one, because it's further to the left. So your unofficial assignment is to go on to Facebook and find all of those images and tell those people to go back to school. <laughs> okay, because I get sent these all the time saying, oh, people can't figure it out. Okay, well, it's just because they don't know the order of operations. Okay, so that's all for today. 